I should be up most of the night to know that. Eh? <laughs> know what it's doing. He had some food last night. I'm telling you. It was a quiet night in hell. It was a quiet night in hell. And a man and his wife were fast asleep. When there was an unexpected knock on the door, the man looked at the alarm clock. It was half past three in the morning. I'm not getting out of bed at this time, he thought. There was another louder knock. Aren't you going to answer that? Asked his wife irritably. So the man dragged himself out of bed and went downstairs. He opened the door to find a strange man standing outside. It didn't take long for the old owner to realise the man was totally drunk. All right, my answer, slurred the stranger. Can you give me a push? No, I can't. It's half past three in the morning and I was in bed, said the homeowner, as he slammed the front door. He went back to bed and told his wife what happened. Well, that wasn't very nice of you, she said. Remember that night we broke down in the pouring rain on the way to pick up the children from the babysitter and you had to knock up that man's door to get us started again. What would have happened if he told us to get lost? Yeah, but that man who just knocked on our door was drunk as a parenter, replied the husband. Well, can we at least help move his car somewhere safe and sort him out a taxi, says his wife. So the husband got out of bed again, got dressed and went downstairs. He opened the door, but he couldn't see the stranger anywhere. So he shouted, All right, hey, do we still want to push? I heard a, I heard a voice out call, Yes, please. So still unable to see the stranger, he shouted again, Where are you doing, my lover? I'm over here, my handsome, said the stranger, on your swing. <laughs> This one's called a washing machine. Uh, we had some confloption here since I last seen him. I put the washing machine on and let him go. When I went out in the kitchen a bit later on, he was swimming in water. What on earth now is that mirror, I says, says I. Jack, come as here a minute and have a bit of look at this. Jack coming hobbling out, newspaper still in his hand. What's all this water, he said. This is a rare caution, isn't it? I'll ring for the man. A calm and unflappable Cornishman is my Jack. Can't say the same for me. I was in some tear and thought we was never going to stop mopping up all that there water. You know what it's like, don't he? If you'd upset a cup of tea, it'd seem as though you've upset a churn roll, don't it? Anyhow, we done it in the end. And then we had to go down laundry with all the towels and stuff we used because if we streamed them through home, and we wouldn't have been able to spin them, see? And there's no drice in the weather yet, is it? And humming they was too. Grafted. We've been having some trouble with the old machine for a bit of a while. I knew. We'd had for Dunkish years, and tell you the truth, we thought he'd gone round land for now, really. Anyhow, next day when the man come out and had a look at him, and for he taught it, or him opened his mouth, I not exactly what he was going to say. Don't bother, I said, how much is it going to cost? It'd been one thing after another lately, piped up Jack. Perhaps we ought to think of having a new one. Now Jack don't t say things like that lightly, and when he do, my better stand back. My gracious, for I know where I was, there we was in ETS, surrounded by washing machines. The little chap, I forget his name, Mr. Lawrence is it called. Anyway, he come forth and started talking about all the different models. Seems as though some to spin faster than others, some you can set to wash with less water, and some are supposed to wash just as clean at lower temperatures. Believe it, do he? And some to work by computer, but I didn't want one of they, I shouldn't know where I was to. I'm quite alone with all off switch, thank you very much, but give me anything too complicated and I wouldn't know where to start. He sound easy when they're telling me in the shop, but he's another thing when you're getting on in there. Anyhow, we owned an ad and eventually we chose one that will do all we need. And he was available in all colours as long as we had a white one. <laughs> You know, I'd have cast my mind back to mother. She used to get up early every Monday morning to do the washing. She put up her towser and light the furnace with hot water. Father would have laid in the sticks, pepper and coal overnight to save her a bit of time. Then she'd get out the big washing tubs. Mind them, Dewey. One for whites and one for colours. Sometimes an extra one for really beastly things like Father's trousers if he'd been scud and dung or anything like that. In no time, she'd be up to her armpits and Suds and bubbles. 
My nails scrub and more suey. Your mother's knuckles last and I shall never know. Then come the blue and bag and the starts for feathers, collars, ready for to go chapel next Sunday. When I think upon it now, all we got to do is put the washing machine in the machine and go and make the beds while he's doing. We don't know we're living now, do us? No. I'd often say, talk about this, because I don't, those that do know me, but I'm one of ten boys and three girls in my family. And I, I can remember a lot of, with the tubs, the scrubbing boards and all that, because we lived over, anybody know where the jam pot cafe is over Gwythian? Well, mother had six of us, because I'm a twin, I've got a twin sister, we're not identical. And, uh, <laughs> but mother had six of us living over Gwythian in a two bedroom chalet, six children under five. Mother and father, you know, so. You get on, didn't he? You know, so. yeah. And I'm proud of, of, of my late mother and father for what they've done, brought us up. We have three children from 13. How many? 13. Th yeah, we're, we're 13, yeah. yeah. And none of us been in prison. Right. Now this one's called Sick Visitors. Well, I had the flu when I lay sick in my bed. I was aching all over from my toe to my head. Then my friends, then my friends came to see how I was doing. And when they all went, I felt like a ruin. The first to come was Mary Jane. Hello, said she. Here, I've got such pain. Going down through my jeans and you'll never believe it. I can't find nothing at all that seems to relieve it. Still, I must suffer in silence and not make a fuss. Oh, look, there's Emily just come off the bus. Said Emily, I must say, you're looking all right. As for me, well, I tell you, I was up half the night, feeling all wished with a pain in my belly. Well, my legs, they seem to be made of jelly. Then in comes Agnes, with a woeful expression. Oh, I'm feeling mortal. I got this here depression. That comes when I've got a lot of housework to do. You ought to be thankful you've only got flu, said Edith. I'm under the doctors because I can't breathe when I run for the bus and my bosom's to heave. She says to lose, he says to lose weight, but you know that's absurd. He'd know I pick up my food like a bird. Is that a box of chocolates? There in, in, in your reach? Pass me the coffee cream and then I'll try peach. And perhaps I'll have a biscuit or two. Oh, I nearly forgot. What's the matter with you? So they sat happily all around the bed, comparing their complaints till someone said, My soul, look at the time. Come girls, we must fly. We've, had a, we've got a hectic night at the WI. We're having a disco with all sorts of dancing. We'll need all our strength for the jigging and prancing. So each of them rose to depart like a shot. The various illnesses quite forgot. To each I did say, you've cheered me no end. I'm sure that tomorrow I'll be on the mend. Thank you for coming. I called weak from my bed and thankfully turned over and covered my head. Now, if you're ever sick and I come to see you, I promise that I won't talk of when I had the flu. Wheels with his wheels. Oh, I've got this one a minute. Keep your clothes on, Ada. Here, boy, said Jan. Did you read about the woman up the line, stripping down to nothing for a calendar design? I had to lay the law down, and I'd done them by and by. I said, keep your clothes on, Ada, down the local W.I. Oh, don't be so daft, said Ada. They are getting me undressed. Why, even bathroom mirrors don't catch me without my best. Oh, that's true, says I. You was never one that ventured off the path. You're the only woman I don't know that what dress to take a bath. But I'm afraid you might be tempted at one of their affairs. I wouldn't trust that Mildred Potts for all her fancy airs. I seen her husband swimming once down off the Golden Mile, and all that he was wearing was a trilby and a smile. <laughs> you keep your clothes on, Ada, as a decent woman do. And if they're looking for a dolly bird, Make sure he didn't you. And when you sing Jerusalem, don't close your eyes no more, or you'll be in the Daily Star on pages three and four. See, 
There's, there's, that, I am, there's some that's I am mighty and as dainty as you wish. But when you get together, they're a different plate of fish. Your mother had it right there, maid, remembering what she said. You keep your clothes on, Aja, and don't ever nod your head. You stick to making chutney, dear, and when you and an in, you button up your overcoat went underneath your chin. And if they're taking photographs and wanting you to pose, you'll be a lady all refined and punch them on the nose. Imagine down the pepper shop the stick there'd be for me if you was on a calendar for all the world to see. They stand in there staring, googly-eyed like pixels down the dell. You're looking peaky, Jan, they'd say, but Ada's looking well. So keep your clothes on, Ada. Your spring chicken days are gone. The sands of time have shifted and continue moving on. Every picture tells a story, so the, st so the saying goes of old, but there's such a thing as stories that are better never told. <laughs> this one's called The Quilt. It was a wild and stormy night upon that Cornish moor, and at that lonely wayside house, a knock came to the door. It says mother on her way to bed, whoever can that be? Now pull your coat down to your neck, you better go and see. A strange young man was huddled there. I'm afraid I've lost my way. It's rather getting rather late. Have you somewhere I can stay? Oh, this house is small. We have no room, poor father shook his head. Our daughter's in the other one. We don't have another bed. He can sleep upon the parlour floor, called mother down the stair, alongside the harmonium with a cushion off the chair. How wonderful, the young man said, and a sob caught in his throat. To get away from all that storm, I can wrap up in my coat. Installed upon the parlour rug, a cushion neath his head, says dad, that's all that we can do. God bless, the young man said. The hours ticked by, and still the gale blew on into the night. But upstairs, mother tossed and turned. She didn't think it right. That young man must be shrimmed with cold upon the parlour floor. We had met a fire in there for at least a month or more. And isn't there a blanket? We haven't got a spare. Not even in Ida's room. It's no use looking there. Go down and see him, Da, she said. My dear, I'm worried sick. And father pulled on boots once more. I'll be down there in a tick. Ma turned to dad, such pleading eyes. In fact, his heart did melt. I tell you what, my flower, he said. I'll offer him our quilt. Oh, a proper job, my cock, says ma. Put a coat across our bed. Dad gathered up the eider down, and for the stairs did head. Are you down there still, my son? Dad down the stairs did call. And do we want our eider down to warm me up at all? The young man stood, his body limp, exhausted and unsteady. No, I don't want your eider down. She's been down four times already. <laughs> I'll do this Willis Diet, man. That's a nice one, too. This one's called Willis Diet. On the day boy Willie and wed Mary, they both vowed that they would be true. Said he, I'll work some hard for you, Mary. Said she, I'll fit you lovely, lovely dinners for you. On Sunday, there'll be roast meat and baked tedders. On Mondays, we'll have bubble and squeak. How about stew and dumplings for Tuesday and a tally for the rest of the week? Wednesday's fried beef done with onions. Thursday will be pasty day with sweet tea and a read of the Cornishman. You can tell I'm brought up the white way. On Fridays, I bet you could fancy a bit of te tasty raw fry. And to finish the week up on Sunday, I'll pity my special sea pie. If you feed me like that, said young Willie, I shan't miss my mother one scrap. For she did fit dinner exactly the same. You know I'm a rare lucky chap. So they started their life together, and Willie feasted each day. No black spot loomed on the horizon until they reached pasty day. Mouth drooling in anticipation, our hero ran fair up the street, but through the door no pasty smell wafted, no perfume of past pastry and meat. Instead he found on the table 
some lettuce and white cottage cheese. He cried, where, where is my dinner? You don't expect me to eat these. But Mary, she cried out in anguish, oh Willie, I've been so alarmed. I've read out today that a pasty will do your husband great harm. There's too many calories and cholesterol in tedas full of, in pastas full of tedas and beef. This cheese and lettuce is best for you, my man. Poor Willie nearly passed out with grief. So he needed the wisdom of Solomon, his problem now to apply. But the thought of a pastiless future brought bitter tears to his eye. In a flash came the obvious answer. Oh, don't even worry, Mary, said he. You fit me a dinner like mother each day, and then I'll eat up the, the diet for tea. Your life is now so harmonious, each contented in their special way. She makes and bakes from morning till night, while he goes patter each day. So brides, just to heed their example, for a blissful wedded life, don't come twixt a man and his stomach, and he'll think you're a perfect wife. <laughs> Jimmy the Jug. You know, poor Jimmy the Jug. This is Jimmy the Jug. Susan Sherman was a very hard spoken woman. Her old man, known as Jimmy the Jug, was very ill in bed. One evening he called to Susan in a very, very weak voice to come up to him. What do you want? she asked. Oh, I fancy I can smell amboiling, we replied poor old Jimmy the Jug. Oh, so you can, suppose. I got one over boiling now. Is that all you want? And went downstairs, she goes again. In a short time, he knocked to the planchion for Susan to come up again. What do you want now? I fancy I could eat a bit of that ham. Well, you went have none, because that's for the mourners. <laughs> he was ill in bed, you see. <laughs> Anyhow. <coughs> a young man called Dickie had been away from home and living on the island for several years. He decided to return and wrote to his father, asking the meeting on a railway station and to be sure and bring the horse as he had heavy luggage. When he arrived, no one was there to receive him, but he saw a man he knew, it was one of his old neighbours, and asked him if he'd seen his father with a horse. I come to tell you the horse is dead. Dead, eh, says. He died, frightened in the fire. What fire, asked Dickie. Oh, your own was burnt to the ground, replied the neighbour. Oh, this is sad news. But where's father? Oh, he's dead too. He caught a cold at the funeral. What funeral? Your mother's. Well, well, own gone, feather gone, and mother gone. Bad as bad can be. No, you haven't heard the worst part of them yet. But what can that be? Your rates have gone up. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to do this one, all right? And then... When Jan was but a fledgling loose, attachment free and single, he found a mermaid in the rocks by Mara's iron shingle. Hello, said she, how do, said Jan, by way of introduction. And as they talked, his heart succumbed to her, skilly, her scaly skin seduction. He wrapped her in his duffel coat for warmth and ease of carriage and took her home, or where he lost, and contemplated a marriage. He placed her in his old tin bath, at which she purred with pleasure. Oh, I had a scrub last month, he said. You can stay there at your leisure. His fingers do for me, he asked. Her lipstick turned to lather. How could you, Jan? She snorted back. It'd be like eating feather. She preened and posed and splashed and cooled, secure in her position. Well, Jan was like a headless chick, so pure was his submission. Her every whim was his to serve, from wine to bed and lotion. And come in, Myra dear, he'd say, with absolute devotion. It was just as though she'd royal blood, while he was but a peasant. And in this vein, he saved his cash to buy his love a present. One day, he handed her a box with bashful obligation. For you, he said, a little treat to show my admiration. She peeled the wrapping off the box and glowered, disbelieving. In acid tones, she said, that's it. Go get the coat, I'm leaving. You took me in and fed me well with herring bones and kippers. But what's a, mer a mermaid supposed to do with a pair of carpet slippers?
I hope that's been all right for you. Yeah. I think that is Will you come again? Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> no, very good.